Hi, everybody. I'm Audrey Moore with Audrey Helps Actors, and this is episode number 44, looking to score in your acting career with your self-tape May. Oh, my God, you guys. We are over a thousand self-tapes, and that is just the public ones. There are so many of you who are doing private self-tapes. You have tagged me in them. I have tried my best to follow you. If you have a private self-tape account and I have not followed you, you just like shout at me and be like, Audrey, follow me. And I'm so inspired. I'm just, the. Are you, are you guys so inspired by everybody getting all the work done and just practicing on whatever it is that you particularly are trying to use the self-tape practice to work on and work towards? I am so excited. Uh, shout out to Sivan, S-I-O-V-H-A-N, Christensen, New York actress, I believe. And I just want to shout out to you, girl. I'm loving your work. And she posted this great post that I really identified with about just having a long day at work and wanting to get this self-tape done. And I just was able to talk with her through the Instagram about, you know, having a life that supports your acting career. And this is one of my favorite things about a self-tape practice, that if you don't have the energy or the attitude to put in the work, then I think it's unrealistic to expect that you're going to be able to have the energy and the attitude to put in your work when the real audition comes. So what I love about this practice so much is that it really challenges you to see what you're prioritizing in your life and is the thing that you're prioritizing your career. And, you know, you don't have to have it perfect yet. You have some things happen maybe at a day of work and that makes you have some realizations and then you can adjust it now before those real opportunities really start rolling in. And so I love that. Uh, You know, if you guys aren't checking out our self-tapes already, they're like super fantastic. So shout out to you, girl. Uh, You're inspiring and I'm super excited about it. Oh, also you guys, one really quick self-tape may shout out to Ian Lyons. Uh, If you're not seeing his safety pins, they're pretty magical. Hey, Ian. Okay, so we have a few iTunes reviews. You guys, you know how much I love those iTunes reviews. Getting an iTunes review is like when you were in school and like it was suddenly pizza day at lunch. That's what an iTunes review feels like. It feels like, hey, by the way, it's pizza day, pepperoni, and you get tater tots. That's how it feels in my heart and in my belly. Okay, so shout out to PJ Corbin, Juliana 96, Mrs. Kelly 113, Michael Lieberman, Nouveau 99, Rorschach, Harbor Theater, The Socks Make the Outfit, and Jake Murphy. You guys, thank you so much. You're awesome. And also shout out to all of those of you who sent me emails or Instagrams or whatever that you booked. You were on your way to an audition and you booked it, you know how much I love that. I even got a little message from Cape Town, South Africa. So what's up, Cape Town? You rule. Okay, today on Audrey Helps Actors, we are talking to Will. We talk a lot about, you know, he came from another market. He was in San Francisco, a smaller market, and he came out here. He got himself a rep right away, I thought in a really interesting and intelligent way. And he's booked something really big right out the gate. And we're just talking about how he can use that and make growth out of that and where he currently is standing and where he has room to grow. So this is a leveling up episode. I hope you enjoy it. I do leveling up episodes for all of you because they're so educational, informational, I think. Informational, is that a good sell for an episode? They're so, they're so informational and exciting. All right, you guys, this episode is brought to you by weaudition.com, promo code Audrey25. I've been practicing. Have you been practicing? Weaudition.com, promo code Audrey25. And also by Greg Saffel, singinglessonslosangeles.com. That's singinglessonslosangeles.com. All right, I hope you're on your way to an audition. And you booked it. Audrey helps actors because they don't know anything. Hi, everybody. I'm Audrey Moore with Audrey Helps Actors. And today we have William H. Bryant Jr. Hi, William. So we met each other at the meetup. Totally. How exciting. Yes, Yes, it was amazing. Wonderful. I'm so glad that you came. I'm so glad that I went. (laughs) My roommate actually told me about the podcast. Mm. 
And I started listening, and then he told me that you were having a meetup. Yay. And I was like, oh, that'd be awesome. And then he said it was at Buffalo Wild Wings. You I was like, like <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel about Buffalo Wild Wings. I'm like, listen, guys, dirty bar food all day, every day. Like, what that's what I want. Ask for right, a nice brew. Oh, yes, yes, very good. Okay, so tell everybody a little bit about yourself, where you are. I'd like to start, as you know, with just a little history. How long have you been acting for? Are you union? What sort of agency landscape do you have? How often a week do you audition commercially or theatrically or right. vice or both? And what are your statistics looking like and how long is it taking you to get to those statistics? Right. Um, so I moved to L.A. Um, in 2016, yeah. uh, November, December. Um, but I started acting uh, in the Bay Area where I'm from, in mm-hmm. San Francisco. Um, born and I, raised? Born and raised. Great. Mm-hmm, where I went to the Beverly Hills Playhouse. Okay. And so um, as soon as I graduated from college in 2013 i moved back home okay what school did you go to i went to simon fraser university in vancouver okay columbia and what did you major in funny enough geography oh my god (laughs) i knew you were gonna say something like geography okay so you wanted to look at maps i actually wanted to work in urban planning oh cool yeah uh i ended up graduating with that degree and falling in love with um with film yeah and started going to a few plays and I was like this is really cool mm. and I'm not playing football anymore mm. so you were so, an athlete yeah uh-huh. tell them how tall you are I'm six foot two and three quarters or He's six, six foot, foot three, three you guys <laughs> he is a tall handsome man some you guys you'll look him up you can google him right now he's a tall handsome man some so you were an athlete played football uh, went to school mm-hmm. uh, tough school yeah um, loved it great experience great. Um, and yeah, you know, they call it Hollywood North. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, there were a lot. I was surrounded by actors, and yeah, and just picked some brains of some of my friends up there who I met who were in the industry, cool. and moved back home. Tried to see what the industry was like in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, you have an audition. Like it was mm-hmm. like maybe a couple weeks after I moved home, hmm. um, and it was for a TV show called Wives with Knives. Uh-huh. Oh, yay. Discovery Channel. My favorite kind of show. Yeah. Wives with knives. I like it. Yeah. And I'm going into this thing, no resume, mm. no headshot, mm. no acting experience. And it was obviously uh, all improv. Mm. So I went in, did it. A couple of days later, I get a call. And they're like, oh, we want to book you for this role. I'm like, what? How fun. Okay, cool. Let's yeah. do it. And yeah. then it was on that set where I was like, I think I might want to do this like forever. Cool. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. Now, did you feel like an awakening had happened? Like that you'd sort of maybe found your calling or did you feel like you'd found a calling that sounded exciting to you? It felt like it definitely filled that void that I had from football. Yeah. I mean, I, I hear that a lot from male athletes is mm-hmm. that they feel that they have a lot in common right. as far as the discipline the uh, energy surge, the focus, uh, the excitement, all of that stuff. You, you get a lot of the same adrenaline bump that you would get out of the competition and the action of it. And is that is that true for you? Is that what you found? Totally, totally. Yeah. There are a lot of things that I've learned from football that I was able to translate directly into acting. And then, Great. I mean, it, de- it definitely helped that this, this role I was... I got hit by a car, sure, right. stabbed, had to fall right. downstairs. Right. And there was a little bit of action. So yeah. I was like, okay, this is, this is fun. His wife stabbed him. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Okay, so you got a sense of discipline. And so now you're in San Francisco. So now talk about how, what year did you graduate? Uh, 2013. Okay, great. So you've been in the business now six-ish years, mm-hmm. right? And you moved to Los Angeles two years ago. Mm-hmm. Now, let's talk about reps. Are you union? What kind of reps do you have? I am union, actually. Um, I just joined about one and a half years ago. Boom! Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Congrats. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Yeah. Did you take um, a picture of you getting your union card? No, but I should have. I think I still have the card. Okay, though. good. I think I still have it's the like, card. It's like, it's the picture in the lobby where everyone like holds the card like, yay, I did it today. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's right a proud moment. Yeah. Congrats. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. And reps? Um, yes, I'm repped. I have 
a theatrical rep, commercial rep, and a manager. Great. Mm-hmm. And how did you get all those? So I actually um, hired a publicist. Oh, um, cool. Upon moving. You hired a publicist. I did. What a boss move, you guys. I (laughs) hear people do that. It worked wonders. I ended up getting like a a ton of meetings. Um, So, yeah, you put together your packet. Yeah. And, you know. With a publicist. With a publicist. And what does this packet consist of? It consists of your resume, everything you've done, a pitch. Yeah. Um, uh, And, you know, all your materials, Mm -hmm. your your headshots, Mm. uh, your reels. Mm Mm-hmm. And basically, you get pitched to agencies who um, trust this publicist. That's and, fantastic. Yeah. And can I ask you, did you hire the publicist for one month, three months? What was your What was your slot of time? It was by number of submissions. Oh, okay. Um, so I think it was 150 submissions or something, 150 agents. Okay. And, yeah. Great. So this is like a packaging department publicist that takes actors and creates a package for them Mm -hmm. with them and then through their relationships with representatives they get seen and get sought out that's really wonderful i mean i don't know a lot of people who have tried that of recent it used to be sort of like more of an old school approach but i definitely think that now that workshops are harder to come by and that showcases are kind of sketchy to sad at best and that this is maybe a good way for you to get seen by a lot of people and take some meetings so how many meetings did you get from your package it took me so yeah it took me three weeks to sign with uh all three Mm. three different agencies great and And did you have multiple meetings 10 10 to 12 i think great meetings great Excellent. Which was, yeah, I, was, I wanted to sign with the very first one. Sure, and they were like, hold off, hold yeah, off. Yeah, good. And yeah, yeah. And my mom telling me hold off too yeah, all the time good. too. She's it's like, good. Yeah, wait, be patient. So It's good to be second generation sometimes for that reason. <laughs> yeah, good. exactly. Okay, so you had about 10 or 12 meetings. And what level agency are we mostly talking about? How, are, are they lower level, medium level, higher level? Like, did you have meetings as far up as like innovative paradigm or was it... A lot of reps that are sort of known for more developing talent. Um, more so known for developing talent because right. I wasn't SAG yet. Yeah, I think that's good. And I just like want to give them a picture, the listeners, right. so that if they decide to do the same thing, they mm-hmm. can sort of understand what would be the advantage or disadvantage to that. Right. Great. So there were a few agencies that did not want to meet with me because I wasn't union, union. yet. Yeah. And I had no idea until that happened. I was That's like, oh. really big. I mean, one of the things that I talk to people about going union is that it's their current reps who are sort of telling them to stay non-union. And those reps aren't necessarily the ones that are going to you're going to grow with necessarily. Mm-hmm. And I say, like, the reps that you're trying to get to won't even see non-union talent. And the reason they won't even see non-union talent is because television, if television and film is your game you won't even be seen as a non-union option into any television or film office right. worth its salt. Right? right. Yeah. So then you had that opportunity because you booked a commercial or what happened that you got Taft Hartley? It was, a, I booked a national commercial um, in the Bay area, Okay. but my part never aired, but I oh. still think, I don't know. That's Is okay, because, that... yeah, when they hire yeah. you to be in front of the camera, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if it airs or not. Right. You get paid initially to shoot, and then, of course, either the spot cannot air or you can get cut out of it. Right. But that doesn't negate the fact that you already showed up to work as a union actor. Well, and so that's usually how it happens for actors is these union commercials because there's a fine that is paid when you are going to tap Hartley someone and that tap Hartley doesn't get approved. Right. What a Taft Hartley letter has to prove is I looked far and wide yeah. and I couldn't possibly find a single other actor who was union to cast in this role. Mm-hmm. And so that's generally not true. And so they get fined. And so an advertising agency doesn't care and they'll pay the fine. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So that's why that occurs. Great. Yeah, so your union, to... you have a commercial rep, you have a theatrical rep that's separate. Mm-hmm, separate. Great, a manager? Manage. Mm-hmm, and my manager. Great, and do you have any local reps anywhere? I'm represented by MDT in San Francisco. Wonderful. Marla Dell Talent. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. 
And are you still doing any work up there locally, or you're mostly here now? If I'm up there, I'll tell them I'm up there for a commercial audition. Sure. Or uh, some a SAG project. Sure. Maybe if I'll, you're in town for family yeah, or something I'm in like town, that. Or if they uh, have a you know a nice co-star or something sure. that's shooting up there locally. Something that seems worth it for the travel. Right. Like 13 Reasons shoots up there and stuff like right. that. Right. So now you have a few credits to your name. How long did it take you from moving to L.A. to booking your first couple of little snippets? Uh, this is a wild story. So November 2016, okay. I signed with my reps. I just got the keys to my apartment. I ended up getting an audition for Young and the Restless mm -hmm. for a recurring, mm -hmm. a recurring role. And I was on my way to that audition. I get a call from my agent. You need to switch your route and go to this audition, which is for Greenleaf. I see. And yeah. they were like, this is my very first audition in Los, Los Angeles. Angeles. Yeah. And he said, it's a, it's a recurring role. It'll, you know, it's, it's big. good role, big, yeah. bigger role than Young, than that Young and the Restless. I'm like, well, it's bigger than Young and the Restless. <laughs> yeah, like, right, I, yeah, <laughs> right, right. My mom watches the show. Yeah, right. It's, it's awesome. He's like, just go. And you need to be seen by the casting director. I'm like, okay, that's a good point. Okay. And so I went and did that mm -hmm. and then left. And then later in the day, they were able to switch my audition time for Young and the Restless. Mm. So I went to that Young and the Restless. Where I get a call from my agent. You've, and he said, you've been shortlisted for Greenleaf. Oh, my gosh. I was like, what? Like, uh? what's, you might have to fly to Atlanta in two days. I was like, w w wait. That's cool. And, um, and then you did. Yeah, so I flew out to Atlanta and then a couple days working on that. And then I get another call while I'm in Atlanta. Mm. And my agent said, this is unheard of, but you also booked Young and the Restless. Whoop, whoop. And I was like, this, my first two auditions mm -hmm. ever in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I was like, what is going on? But yeah. Well, that's just so exciting. Yeah, it was, it was pretty wild. That is I, pretty I wild. No idea. Yeah, I was just Very good. in a lot of shock. Well, so you sent me, I asked you to send me like all of your stuff mm -hmm. for me to like look over because this is actually going to be what I call a leveling up episode. When you're coming to acting as like your second discovery, mm -hmm. like you've had something else be sort of your focus for a while that you think that you're behind. And what I try to explain to you is that, yes, maybe in hours of acting class and hours of acting training, you're behind, but you usually are quite ahead on how you view things you know there's when you're not coming at it from like i've been acting since i was seven point of view mm -hmm. i find that actors have a better understanding of that this is a business if you are coming from another competitive field like being an athlete there is an understanding of what competition is and what it means to be competitive and the work and the work ethic that is involved in that right. and so i try to communicate to them yes there are other there are some detriments that you might carry with you, but there are also huge assets that you have that actors who've been acting since they were seven and gone to all these drama camps in the summertime and then gone to conservatories, they walk out like so capable as actors and then mm -hmm. just completely incapable when it comes to treating it like a profession. Right. So did you have any experience as far as like an understanding of it being a profession and navigating it that way? Yes, actually. It kind of came with, the money management. Mm, tell um, me about that. That's great. When I booked Greenleaf, this is the most I've ever yeah. booked on. And you make it so, like in a day. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, right. it's ridiculous. Right. And so I didn't learn what I need to do to save money and mm -hmm. what uh, what parts of the business I need to put money in. Yeah. I had just moved to L.A. Right. So I didn't have a chance to learn like step by step. Yeah. Like what to do, what to invest in for my career. Yes. Right. And so... I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take classes later. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm working. I'm flying back and forth. Yeah, right. Like, and then you kind of put that off, and then you have these living expenses, just mm. you know, normal expenses, mm -hmm. rent, Los uh, Angeles food. living expenses. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah, those it's add no up. Joke. Plus, mm -hmm. you know, the all the extra activities that mm -hmm. there there are to do in this city. You know, I I don't ever want to begrudge anyone like living a life, but what you're really talking about is this thing that nobody's teaching actors, which is about the bang and bust mentality Absolutely. of money in our business. It's, we live a life of windfalls. Mm -hmm. Most people in a lifetime are lucky to get one or two windfalls in their life. They're usually some form of an inheritance that comes randomly of like an uncle who passed away, who happens mm -hmm. to leave you 
some random cash somehow or something that could happen in your career where right. you get some kind of bonus or you win the lottery or something like that. Like windfalls for most everyone else mm -hmm. are few and far between in their life. They maybe will get one to two in a lifetime. But an actor lives their life on windfalls. Right. So you book one job. Let's say you make 70 grand off of that job. You feel, because you don't know any better, that 70 grand is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And what they don't teach you is like, well, there's no guarantee that that 70 grand will repeat itself right. into another year. And exactly. even though you have what you feel is the legitimacy of that credit and that money, the unfortunate discovery that nobody cares continues to be a harsh reality for a lot of actors when they feel like they've Absolutely. made a resume bump and that should matter something because it matters something to them. Right. And then once you take out your manager, you take out your agent, and then you take out your taxes, mm -hmm. you're now looking, if you've made 70 grand, like 45 grand maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and 45 grand is enough to live in Los Angeles. That's like mm -hmm. cost of living in LA. And not like... I'm living really great. That's just like, I live in Los Angeles. 45 grand is maybe like, I can afford to invest maybe five grand back into my career. Right. Right. Which is, yeah, that's that's definitely the lesson that I started learning. Uh, mm. Because I did have a survival job. Mm -hmm. And um, Are you still keeping that or you've gone full into acting? Well, my survival job in, uh, in, San, Francisco? in San Francisco, the Do desk you... job. I mean, fortunately right now... You're doing well. I'm able to, Great. yeah, um, live based off work. Great. But like you said, like this isn't guaranteed and I'm not, you know, I'm... I would like to get to a point where I'm able to do all that and more. Yes. To live and more and invest and, yes. and uh, create my own projects. You guys, he produce. just said the word invest. How many of you guys are thinking about investing? I know like none of you. <sighs> you guys are in such deep survival mode mm -hmm. that like the concept of being in a place where you would invest is like almost impossible for you. But wait, Will, wait, I get it. You're a model. You're so fabulous. But I have to interrupt you. Help me. I need some help. And now it's time for listener questions. I'm so scared. This listener question is brought to you by weaudition.com. That's weaudition.com, promo code Audrey25. You guys, I use it at least a couple times a week. I am going through and I am working on just running sides, running it, getting it in my body, getting the words in my mouth and making sure that I am as solid and clean in my work. Just in my practice, you know, I know that that sounds like a lot, but I'm really working on a kind of facility that leaves me feeling really free in some of my auditions. And I can't stress highly enough how much easier it is for me to just click on with somebody and just run it. You know, I always feel bad, like sometimes making my friends do it too much, I feel bad about it. So if you, like me, have a slight people-pleasing problem when it comes to your friends, then We Audition is the solution for you. Promo code Audrey25. Hey, Audrey. I'm an actor living in New York and fresh out of college. I signed with my first theatrical agent pretty much right after school and I'm about halfway through my one-year contract with them. Um, I really love my agent, and I feel like she really pushes for me, and I go out really a good amount. But I haven't been booking as of yet. I'd really love to renew my contract with this agent in a few months, so do you have any tips on how to keep your agent interested when your contract is near its end, but your booking ratio isn't great? Thanks, Audrey. Hey, girl. Hey. So a few things about this. I know this is a really big thing that a lot of actors feel. You know, when you sign with an agent, it feels like every month that goes by that you're not booking, you're just like panicked for your life that they're going to drop you. So I want to explain to you, first of all, that a lot of agents view their actors as, you know, works in progress. So if you're just coming out of college, then that means that you're building your career, you're building your reputation. And unless you have real solid reason to believe that this is an agent that would drop you after one year, then I would say this is a story that you're making up for yourself that is hurting you, not helping you. 
most agents don't have that feeling. They sign you with an understanding that there's a growth period, particularly, I would say, with actors who are coming straight out of college. You know, you're probably not union yet. And you don't have the same relationships that somebody who's been there even a couple years longer than you has. And you're getting opportunities, but I don't know how many opportunities you're getting. Are you getting five opportunities or are you getting five opportunities a month? Because if you're getting five opportunities a month, well, that might be something to really start considering your booking ratio and realize that there might be an execution issue. There also might be a marketing issue. This is something that I talk with actors about all the time in my day-to-day life. You might be being sold in a way that once you get into the room, that's actually not your casting, and that can really hinder your statistics. You might also have an execution issue. So when you're going in, you're not executing in a way that equals bookings. And in the beginning, it can be really hard to tell which one it is, and that's why I really recommend you gather your data Every audition you have, you should be writing it down and then you should be watching who it is that booked it. And for you, you know, since you have an agent, since you're repped, you know, compare that agent and that booking to whoever it is that is actually booking the job, right? So if you're with this agency and the person that you lose the job to, is it William Morris Endeavor and has been acting since they were seven? Well, that's not necessarily a fair fight, I would say. And I would say you probably did a really good job and you should just know, like, keep working. If you are starting to look at your statistics and realize that, you know, what they're doing in the show is so different from what you did in the audition, then you might realize that you have an execution issue. My biggest takeaway from this is actually one year is just not a lot of time to be able to assess, particularly when you're new to this career, whether or not you're working properly. And for that reason, I would imagine your rep probably isn't like, you know, chomping at the bit to drop you and having the energy of somebody who is like, God, just don't lose this agent is not going to help you book jobs either. So uh, calm down, chill out. And I really recommend for any in-person auditions that you have, you know, self-tape them beforehand. So that way you can know more or less what you probably were doing in the room. And you can compare that to what happens once it makes it on the air. And you can start to really learn and grow from it. And I know everyone listening to this question is like, no, (laughs) because we get that. I mean, we get it. We've been there. And uh, don't give energy to your career that you don't need. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. Great. So at the meetup, we had talked a little bit about your dreams. I was Mm -hmm. like, I was like, what do you want? I was like very aggressive (laughs) at the meetup. I was like, what do you want to be? What's your dream role? (laughs) You got to be. Yeah, that's right. And so I said, what, what's your dream role? And you said, I want to be a superhero. Yeah. Great. Okay. So they may not know this because we're on a podcast. So do you want to tell them uh, what diversity you are? I am black, African American. That's, right. That's mm-hmm. right. And I was like, can we please have you be like the first African American Clark Kent? Like you would be so perfect oh for it. Gosh, that'd be amazing. I know, because he's got these amazing glasses, you guys. And I was like, <laughs> take the glasses off. I was like, you're Superman, you're Clark Kent, you're Superman, you're Clark Kent. <laughs> would be fantastic. Dream I would just come true. I would love that for you. Yeah. Great. So let's talk a little bit about uh did you have you talked to your roommate about how you were coming today? I did. Your roommate was very, uh, he's he's a very animated person. And I could tell he would probably have a lot to say. So (laughs) what did your roommate say about you coming today? And I guess my main question is like, how can I help you? One of my biggest wonders or questions is how, how, how do I become a superhero? Yeah. So that's specific, but I guess it would help others who do want to get into specific types of castings, maybe. Sure, Um, sure. Well, so I think you're really great for the superhero world. mm -hmm. And then there's a couple of versions that we can be talking about. We can be talking about feature films. Mm -hmm. And then we can also be talking about these sort of universes that are happening on television right now. You're right for the picking for that world. So when you're looking at these box office blockbuster feature films. Right. One thing that like all of those actors have in common is that they've all won an Oscar. So the sh- quickest sure. way to become Captain Marvel is to 
have a, I mean, she's been here since she was like seven, right? right? She's from NorCal too. Right. North and Cal. then pursue <laughs> acting for so long and then get a little indie darling role that then you get an Oscar off right. of. And then from that Oscar, you too will be Captain Marvel. That's like the Easy. thing that happens every year. It's like Jennifer Lawrence booked her Oscar and then she got her Marvel. It's like, that's kind of, so, right. you know, just Piece of cake. get an Oscar mm -hmm. and then become Superman. Perfect. Done. Okay, great. So that's advice for you for that. Uh, but <laughs> write, that far, down. <laughs> write that down. Uh, but to break that down even a little bit further mm -hmm. is what I would say, looking at your assets versus like your detriments, right? So a huge asset that you have is your physical prowess, I would say. You're a mm -hmm. handsome, tall, capable guy. You also are very uh, mild-mannered in a lovely way. You, you are not somebody that I'm worried about is going to throw like a crazy tantrum <laughs> on set. Like you seem level-headed and gracious which is a real Thank asset you. and a real asset particularly for uh good-looking men and women because they are needed in this business and that will never go away and uh some of them are dicks so if you True. right so if you could not be that then that automatically will make you more of an asset right but another thing to talk about is to what degree you have a desire for any of these meteor roles outside of just being a, a superhero. So do you have a desire for that? Right, absolutely. Okay, um, I love uh, roles like, lawyer, well, I play a lawyer now, but I, yes. love, I love those mm. those types of roles. Lawyer, uh, policeman, mm. doctors. Mm -hmm. um, I love the jargon. You do. I, I do. Yeah, you're very good off script. You guys, I had him send me his self-tapes, and he's really great off script which is a real yeah. skill that a lot of people don't have so did the did being off script come naturally to you or did you work on it i had to work on that because Good. as soon as it, it took me a while because as soon as you know a camera gets in my face mm. it's like uh um mm -hmm. but you know just reps and getting exactly um, more familiar and comfortable with uh, your surroundings really did you have a practice of that or just going to class or how did that go for you? Mostly class. Great. Um, you know, audition class here or there. Great. Um, and then scene study. Great. Um, Excellent. And just just getting comfortable. Great. So if we're going to talk about, you know, getting those larger roles and going the route of being an actor that people are fans of, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think it's not just that, like, the millennials are a fan of, but also their moms, right? right? So like, that's what happens when you get a claim, so <laughs> to speak, is that you have these actors that, regardless of age, have such fanship uh, of mm -hmm. all ages, because what they're looking for is who's going to sell the box office, right? right? Totally. So how do you become a box office hit? Right. You just don't have the hours and training that other actors might have right. but what i will say is in your category that's not uncommon i there's not a ton of six foot three ex football player handsome men who how long did you model did you ever model i modeled a little bit yeah. while i was who, like, like model when i was a kid sure, and, sure, sure. and there yeah who have that sort of background who are then also conservatory trained that right. is that is more of a minority within a minority right mm -hmm. so it's a different conversation with you than maybe somebody else because what's uncommon for you is not uncommon, if that makes sense. Yeah, right. absolutely. But if you want to have aspirations to be as capable as those other actors, mm -hmm. there is a little bit of work that has to be done. Absolutely. Right? Do absolutely. you feel that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, great. Well, I can tell you really absorb. I can tell you're like quiet but absorbing, <laughs> which is how Jesse is, so I get it. You know, you're sort of hang back, but you sponge. So you're like a secret, like kind of like a secret, <laughs> secret weapon in that, right? Like, don't uh, yeah, see me coming, yeah. but I'm absorbing and then I will squish you. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. So I would say, even though you're working, what I don't want to have happen to you is what happens to a lot of people who have a kick in the beginning. They have like a bump. Right. And because they get that bump and they think like, oh, this is what it is, that then when that bump starts to dry out, because careers just do, they have ebb and flow. Absolutely. And it may be a while before you see your ebb. It may be a few years. 
But what happens is that they've been on this track of things seeming to come easy to them, that then when it starts to get harder, they uh, they bounce they pretty quickly right. because they're in so much pain personally about about it not being easy suddenly, right? right? And I don't think that you think it's easy, but you have an experience, what most people experience, which is like 10 years of being out here and nobody caring, right? right? Mm-hmm. So there's just a different expectation that will naturally come along with that. Right. So I really want to make sure that in the interim and as you're working, that you're continuing to really work on your craft. So are Absolutely. you doing that? Absolutely. Every chance I get. I saw a, uh, an interview with Brian Cranston mm, mm-hmm. and the main thing that I got from it was make sure you are using your tool over and over and over mm-hmm. working, whether it is student films mm-hmm. or class mm-hmm. or making your own projects. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As long as you keep swinging the bat, then you stay sharp That's and right. uh, you're not you know, just kind of sitting by waiting for the next opportunity and letting anxiety come in Mm -hmm. or stress come in. There's no room for it because you know you're... You're working. Yeah, I got to do it. I'm still working, so... Yeah, the saying from uh, Milton was production is the basis of morale. Mm. So, like, when actors stop acting, they feel sad. And so if you are listening to this right now and you feel sad, that's because you're not putting the acting in. And when you ignite yourself with your own passion, people can see it. Yeah. And it's kind of, to a certain degree, I mean, I'm a real proponent on this podcast. I'm a real big fan of having something that you are doing to continue to keep your passion alive and ignited is really right. powerful. Are you auditioning right now? Because uh, you've got these other contracts in play. So to, to what degree are you able to audition? Still auditioning. Okay, good. Um, There's self-tapes coming in maybe once or twice a week. Okay, good. And uh, do you have a coach that you're working on with those? Sometimes I do, mm-hmm. but if the turnover is, uh, yeah, the turnover is, has been quite fast, yeah. actually. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I love breathing it in for myself first mm-hmm. and then seeing a coach. Yeah, I agree. I like that. When I get a chance to, I, yeah. I, try, to, I try to find a coach for sure. Because <clears throat> how many self-tapes have you had in like the last year? We'll say. Yeah, we could say one a week. Okay, so 52-ish self-tapes. Mm-hmm. Right. Of those 52, how many have you booked? Zero. That's what I want to talk to you about. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think you've got these two bookings that you came out swinging with and that's really exciting and I'm really excited for you about them. Right. But 52 self-tapes without any traction is not good enough for you. And I want absolutely. more for you. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, good. So have you ever considered that reality? I have, but not in that big space yes. more so on oh i didn't book the last couple right you know what i mean right so. i always tell you like really look at your statistics because they're actually really not lying to you right like i started to notice that my drama statistics were higher than my comedy statistics mm-hmm. even though i was playing the comedic relief in dramas and so i realized that there was like an adjustment that needed to be made in my execution of comedy versus my execution of drama mm-hmm. but i could only make that conclusion after a certain amount of swings Right. Of the bat to mm-hmm. realize, like, because if you're only swinging three times, that's not enough data. But if you've had 52 self tapes in the last year, then I think it's safe to conclude that something isn't working. Right. Now, what is the something that's not working? That's something that we can discuss. Mm-hmm. So, have you been following who it is that's booking the jobs that you've been self taping? I have not actually. Do you think that would be a good idea? Great. That's a great idea. You're it welcome. is. <laughs> yeah and why is that a great idea for you uh to see what casting is looking for great i want to adjust that thought a little bit more not just what casting is looking for but other things that you can sort of see mm-hmm. such as i like to tape myself tapes obviously but even the auditions i go in the room for i tape mm-hmm. beforehand and mm-hmm. then what i do is i hold on to that footage and then I mark on a calendar when it's going to come out, and then I compare the two. Yes. Not because I'm trying to be like, who's a better actor? Because once you get to a certain level, you realize it's not about that. Mm-hmm. But story-wise, what are some interesting choices that were made that maybe I don't think of as natural go-to choices? Absolutely. Like, I, Audrey, tend not to choose a sentimental. I don't really, I'm not a sentimental person, so it's not color I usually bring to the table. And I've had to learn to decide 
at, on my checklist that I go through, oh, do a take and pump in some sentimentality. Right. Because the rest of the world is far more sentimental than I am. Not as a knock against it at all, just mm -hmm. how I am versus how others are, that I have to remember that a lot of these shows, a lot of these network shows are looking for really, you know, play in the heartstrings. And so to whatever degree I can just like add that color to it has helped my bookings out a lot. Right. But it was only through noticing that that was a color that they were adding that I was just sort of unconsciously leaving off the table. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And that's um, one thing that I really try to value in class, too, mm. because that second opinion or second eye yes. that I get, like one one of my notes that I'm just started needing to work on right. is to be more of that masculine, be more grounded. Ah, uh, interesting. Yes, I see what you're saying. Because right. you have a softness about you. Right. Right, which is not uncommon for athletes at all, mm. actually. I think you guys express yourselves physically. Right. And so then expressing yourself vocally is far more right. challenging. Right. It's, Do you feel that? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's more of a workout that mm -hmm. way it is isn't it? and so yeah um so i want to talk about that because one of the notes i have on looking at your materials is your vocal expression so mm -hmm. are you in voice class i haven't been in a voice class for a while yeah how long have you done voice class for i when i was doing voice classes it was for uh, a few months yeah mm -hmm. i just need you in way more voice class right it's going to be very uncomfortable you know how people who are unathletic mm. then feel working out? Yeah. Like they kind of yeah. just kind of hate it and it kind of feels like a drag. That's how it feels. That's how it feels. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? That's how it felt when I first started taking voice classes. It's a pain in the ass. It's like, ah, oh, my voice sucks. Yeah. You, it's hard, right? It's <laughs> yeah. like a lot of confront. Yeah. And what people don't realize is just like when you work out your physical self, mm -hmm. you start to get a little more confidence, you start to get a little bit more understanding of like just how your body works, right? right and like how the brain connects to the body is its own thing and you feel strength maybe or you feel flexibility, which is like it's all to me it translates. If you feel more flexible in your physical self, you feel more flexible in life. And if you right. feel more strength in your physical self, you feel more flex or you'll feel more strength in life. Absolutely. And so too is true for the voice, my friend. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's, I would say, the one thing if you are interested in these doctors and lawyers is you have, yes, I would say a facility with text where you can wrap your mind around it in a very good way, most of which is that it has an ease to it. So many people who take like heavy text yeah. is that it sort of battles them. They don't really sort of write it, kind of like a wave. Right. And you do have a good facility that it feels like you're writing it. Mm -hmm. But where you're missing out on is in diction and I would say in just vocal expression. Right. Does that make sense to you? It sure does. He says, it sure does. <laughs> so what do you think about that? It definitely all connects. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest things is, like you said, it does give you that confidence mm -hmm. and it feeds into you know it feeds into a lot of things in your psyche as well yes and yeah feeling comfortable with with what your uh what message you're trying to convey what message you're literally projecting exactly with your voice exactly absolutely yeah and just it's very like important <laughs> yes it is it's very important i just i feel like i want to be the person to really communicate it to you because I think you've got mm. so much going for you and you're only as good as your weakest link. Absolutely. Right? Of course. And so as an actor who to me has so much passion and so much capability, mm -hmm. if you have a link that is so clearly not as strong as the others, you would want to do everything you can to mm -hmm. strengthen it. Right. Right. So let's talk about a few things within men of why voice is avoided and why I think it's so important. Yes. Uh, because you're a strong man. I think having vocal resonance mm -hmm. that has as much power as your physical body has right. is probably going to be an asset to you. And I don't want to take away from the softness. I just want you to have a library. It's another color. Right. Absolutely. And. When you're playing these uh, very intelligent roles, a lot of people who are like conservatory trained mm -hmm. and have like 
done voice training like up their ears and then they like yeah. leave college and they're like, I like more voice training. Blah, 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 blah. I can really only cast them in highly intelligent roles because there's something about the way that they communicate that has so much confidence in the communication. Right. And the confidence in the communication, I equate to a facility with language. Absolutely. Which is about resonance and about diction. So if you're going to be a doctor rattling off a bunch of uh, information, it's important that the audience be able to hear the things you're rattling off and understand them quite clearly because that is, in fact, the story, right? right? So we need to know that they have a aorta something something amulism <laughs> with a something something and get me so da da da. Right. Trust me, if they didn't want the actors to say those words, they would not have them say them because nobody wants to learn them, of course. right? No, yeah. So if you're going to be saying them and and then they're important, and I think that it's. I really like to like look ahead. Right. Right? Do you like that? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, like mm-hmm. look ahead of like where you're going. Where's mm-hmm. like some possibilities in your casting and how mm-hmm. can you get ahead of strengthening the things that you think might be valuable to you yes. as your casting grows. Mm-hmm. And I think as you mature and become more of a grown ass man, right? <laughs> that that is an important color right and i i also love the idea if we're talking about like this clark kentness Mm -hmm. i love the idea of you having yourself as you sit here in front of me a little more meek a little more soft in your voice um you guys should see he's sitting like he's just sitting like an (laughs) eight-year-old boy it's very very sweet (laughs) you know but it's it's very well behaved and just there's the smallest bit it's not even an apology it's it's like a Contained. Yeah. Contained. That's right. Like you're sitting in school, right? Yeah. And so what I would say is that to me is great for Clark Kent. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to then transform into Superman, right? Yeah. You got to flip the switch. You got to flip the switch. And I think that it's it's a little imbalanced, mm-hmm. your vocal ability to flip the switch. Right. I feel like, like you said, it will it'll behoove me to take voice classes and um i think so be able to access that and here's like easier absolutely instead of taking you know weeks and weeks of rehearsal too <laughs> yes that's exactly right and a lot of men particularly when you are as tall and as strong and as handsome as you it's easier to have a soft vocal tone because otherwise you're really going to stand out. Right. <laughs> right. You really are. And I know that because I'm 5'10", which is tall for women, tall. Mm-hmm. and I'm quite bossy. And so I know that for me, to, like if this podcast was in this tone, this would be like a very different <laughs> podcast. And totally so my different. vocal inflection is partly a choice. It stays up in what's called my facial mask, right? right? stays up in like my cheekbones and my eyes which is just a little bit of a softer sweeter place for a vocal tone to sit and when I'm playing characters where I'm very uh, emotional Mm -hmm. I'm very strong even when I just like do this I automatically feel a lot more emotional I feel more vulnerable and my voice naturally brings out those colors and those tones for me Right. By right? itself, automatically. Yep. Automatically does mm-hmm. the work for you. Great. So voice class then you're gonna do, you're gonna start. Voice class, yep. Okay, and here's what I need for you for voice class is I need you at least once a week. How often are you working out? How how many hours a week are you working out? About twelve hours a week. I need twelve hours a week of voice class. Of voice working out. See how you hate it? See how you automatically like want to stab yourself in the throat? I want you to, but this is such a great lesson because people who are athletic think about other people who are unathletic and they're just like, just go. Yeah. Like, if you want to be fit, just go to the gym. Just eat less. Just watch what you eat. It's so easy. It's so easy. Just go to the gym. Like, <laughs> stop complaining and go to the gym. And then people who don't want to go to the gym are like, no, like, I don't want to do that. And for them to go to the gym like three times a week is like a monumental achievement. And so I say yes. And I say you are caught. (laughs) If you're going to be putting in 12 hours. Exposed. If you're going to be putting in 12 hours into your physical 
body and you have an understanding that it is important for you to be in this kind of shape for your casting right. and you have to do the work that you would do physically for the kind of casting you want to fulfill do all of it yep then i'm saying yes voice also do all of it and it's gonna suck <laughs> i want you to yeah. know personally it sucks because it's a, it's your identity right it's like an identity thing and when you start to open up your your vocal depth, mm -hmm. it's your voice. Your voice comes through. Right. And for a lot of, I think, very powerful people, it's easy for you to calm and quiet your voice a bit because there's risk involved in right. being loud and powerful. 100%. Right? Yeah. And it's it's weird because, like, when it comes to theater, like, I had no problem projecting, um, mm -hmm. learn mm -hmm. from my past, you know, vocal classes, and mm -hmm. um, and I, I do my warm ups, sure. project, good, you're great, and mm -hmm. then you throw a camera in front of me, and I start like okay. getting like this, and mm -hmm. and then you throw a mic on me, even worse, because <laughs> I know you can hear me. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And Again, I don't want to take that away from you. I just mm -hmm. want it to be a choice for you to have range because I mm -hmm. think that there is so much tremendous potential in your range. And here's what I want to say. The range you're going to get in your career is going to be the range you create for yourself in your real life. That's a quote. Write that down. Boom shakalaka. <laughs> so if you're only creating a small amount of range in your life, mm -hmm. which is I work out 12 hours a day, but I don't give any attention and time to my voice. And an actor is body and voice. Like how we are different from other artistic fields is we use our body and voice for our expression. Right. Right. Absolutely. So it's like, it's like, it's like you're trying to play football, but you cut one of your arms off. And I'm like, don't. Why'd you cut your arm off, man? You need that. You can and you're use like, it. Yeah. yeah, you're like, I'm just going to play really well without it. And I'm like, <sighs> no, you can do really well without that arm because you're a really capable person. But on the other hand, like, I think you should keep that arm. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. But you're not even cutting it off. You're just kind of tying it to your body. Yeah. And I'm like, don't just not use it. Use it. Work your work yeah. that arm out, man. Absolutely. Work it out. Absolutely. Good. Lesson received? Absolutely. Okay, yes. just remember you're not gonna want to do it. <laughs> and then when you think about how you don't want to do it, I want you to think about all the times that you have been hard on people for not just doing the work physically. Mm -hmm. And I want you to take that in and know like you can't ask more of others than you will ask of yourself. Absolutely. Okay, good. Yes. Love it. But wait, Will, wait. I get it. You're a model. You're so fabulous. But I have to interrupt you. Help me. I need some help. And now it's time for Listener Questions. I'm so scared. This listener question is brought to you by Greg Saffel. That's Greg Saffel at singinglessonslosangeles.com. You guys, everybody loves Greg. I send people to Greg all the time. He does have an ability for you to see him no matter where you are. In addition to being excellent, he is also very reasonably priced and he is so good at what he does. I want you to know I get text messages pretty regularly from people who are like, uh, I finally went to Greg and I have to tell you, he's really amazing. And I'm like, I know, I told you that he was really amazing. So whatever your vocal needs are, whether that's getting more resonance as we're talking here with Will, if that is having more vocal dimension, being able to change your voice to do certain things comfortably with different characters in a way that doesn't damage your voice, whether that's vocal fry or even uh, diction, pronunciation, making sure that when you are speaking, people can understand you because if you can't, then you're not telling the story. So many of you are California born and raised. I need to talk like this. I can't understand anything to say because you guys are just like so mellow and chill and nobody tells you that you're so mellow and chill that you forgot to pronounce any of your words. So that's just something to look out for. And I deeply and wholeheartedly, fervently even recommend Greg Saffel. SingingLessonsLosAngeles.com. 
Hey, Audrey, it's Jeffrey Welk here. Um, so I have a question because I just had an issue where I was just dropped uh, by my commercial agent. And uh, so I was just wondering how to approach that topic when I have meetings with other agencies. Uh, thanks. Uh, I love your show. Thanks. Bye. Hi there, Jeffrey. Thanks so much for this really great question. I think a lot of people feel this and approach for their, by this subject. You know, I think the best thing to do is to say that you had to step away from commercials for a moment because you had something else going on, whether that was a play or you were working on a film or you had to go home and take care of something and you weren't available for your commercial agent anymore. And so you decided uh, to part ways very amicably. And if they ask you why you're not signing with that person again, I would say, you know, I generally didn't feel that the communication was as great as it needed to be. And so I thought I'd try elsewhere. And I think that's good. Generally speaking, if you haven't booked commercials, which is probably why you were dropped, uh, you're probably not going to get like a super outstanding commercial agent anyway. You're probably just going to get another person who's more or less going to submit you commercially. I want you to know I've sat in lots of agent meetings and I've not once ever had an agent say to me, so why aren't you with your old agent? Because if they're meeting with me, they're excited about me also. So they're not trying to investigate why they shouldn't take me. Usually they're trying to investigate how we could work together and if this is a good fit. Good luck. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. Now, as an actor who wants to do comic books... Are you involved at all in any stunt classes here in Los Angeles? Not yet, but I okay. I um, have definitely looked into some, but you need to follow through. You yeah. just need to simply follow through. Well, this is, this is the thing is I really recommend to everybody that you, no matter where you are in your career, I don't care if you're phase one or you're phase four, like I don't really care. It is important for everybody to have one or two people that they meet with Every six months and then every other six months, you know, twice a year, three times a year, whatever you need to just make sure Hold you accountable. that you're staying focused. Yeah. And some of you have no problem being held accountable, but what you need is somebody to tell you to chill out. And so that's another thing. So some of you are like, well, I hold myself accountable. I'm like, yeah, but you need somebody to be like, hey, have you gotten laid at all? <laughs> are have you enjoyed a glass of wine and a bath like so check i need you to calm it down a notch on your neuroses and go live your life so important so important. so important and some of you it's like i need you to live a little less of your life and i need you to get some work done that's me <laughs> it's fine everyone has one right and right. It's a, you just need somebody that's going to help you in whichever direction you're trying to go into okay then do you know the names of the casting directors who are casting all of the superhero shows and any of the superhero movies. I have a few of them from the shows. Okay. Um, I need to make this list longer. Great. Do they know who you are? Not yet. Great. So you need to find a way to make sure that they are aware of you. And then you need to ask yourself, would I have what they need for them to consider me? And how do we find that out? What a great question. How do you find that out? So one way is by looking at who's booking those roles. And I encourage you not just to look at men in the African-American community. I, right. I encourage you to just look generally at who's booking superhero roles right now and what kind of credits did they have when they booked that job what sort of representation do they have? Do they have a relationship with that casting director already? Some of them, you can find interviews of them talking about how they booked it. That would be like a good interview for you to read or listen to on a podcast or something like that. There's all kinds of like nerding out type podcasts about all things Marvel and DC. Right. Okay. So I think you would have tremendous luck just really starting to focus in on who are those actors? Who are those writers? What do those scripts look like? If I were you and I wanted to be in that world and I was practicing self-tapes, I would be researching, all finding sides tapes. for all of those 
and then making sure that all of the self-tape practice that you're doing is in that direction. And what I think it's important for you to have a good coach that you're working with is it's a little like you practice with the right coach before you start right. going into the game, mm -hmm. right? So you're working on those sides, executing them, holding them, and then hopefully you know, that person's episode or whatever has already aired. And you can right. see like, oh, this is what they did. Oh, this is what that genre is. Just collecting information in advance. Of course. For the area in which you're trying to impinge. Right? Absolutely. Great. Yes. And then you need to make sure that they are aware of you. So do your reps know that this is an area that you want to be going into? They do. They do. Mm -hmm. Great. And are they reminded that it's an area you want to be going into? No, that can be... Amped up a bit. Them. Yeah. So there's a fun way to do that. There's really fun ways to do that. Listen, if you sent like a cookie bouquet basket of the comic <laughs> book characters you want to play to your agents for like whatever reason, they get the message and they get cookies. Right? Win-win. Win-win. <laughs> and it's from you and I'm sure they adore you. So it's not, it's not going to be seen as this like, ugh. Right. Oh my God, I can't believe, like, I, I know you, like, I know you, I'm going to comic books. How many of your self-tapes in the last year have been for anything comic book related? One. Okay, what I do you think. think about those numbers? Yeah. Not great, right? No. no, no, no. And so whose fault do you think that is? I will take all the blame. Yeah, you should. You should take all the blame. Because yeah. I think that those roles are fantastic for you. I think that if I were a person who cast those worlds or was a producer or a writer on those worlds and I was listening to this podcast and then I Googled you, mm -hmm. I'd be like, swoop, swoop you up, right? I think that you have the attitude that's great for those worlds because they go fast. It's yeah. a 24-hour action movie. You know, that universe where it's like The Flash and everybody, it's like all of them. Right. So those writers aren't just communicating with their own writers. They have to communicate with the other writers. They have to communicate with the other writers. And they have to get approval by network and by any of the comic book worlds. Absolutely. Producers. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge machine and it's running really fast really fast and i think that you have a temperament that would be such an asset on that so they just need to know about you so to whatever degree any day that goes by that you have free time where you're not spending looking at those shows researching who those writers are mm -hmm. researching who those directors are finding out when they're casting you know most cw network shows are part of the fall episodic season. Right. So they begin casting usually in July-ish mm -hmm. and end casting in like February. Right. Now there are some that are going to like Netflix or the wherever. Netflix ones, right. And those are sort of a little bit more off season. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so that would mean you would want to have your materials and relationships in place by the time that started again. So what I'm going to say to you is if you know you'd like to be a part of that world, then by July, you need to have a few things in order. Right. You need your materials in order. I would really recommend you taking that uh, fight class mm -hmm. and learning some of that. So that's like a special skill that you're comfortable with and bringing into it. Because I do think you have a huge asset in your athleticism, right? Mm. And then I think having some footage that you create, which may be expensive but invaluable in the long run, could be really helpful to you. Yeah. So my friends who started booking in those areas all went and made footage for themselves that like was nice stunt footage yeah right. it was like connected still to story but yeah where they showed them kicking butt and taking names right. and you don't need a lot you need like 30 seconds of it and you don't have that footage right now and they don't have to take a risk but if you had that i think open doors yeah. all the way for you okay yeah. how many actor friends you know who are at all working in that world Two or three. Great. And how often are you talking to these two or three? Not enough. Yeah. I mean, I think that's yeah. what they say. Like, hang out with people that are where you want to go. Abs yeah, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So just whatever degree you can, like, strengthen that relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was that helpful? So, so, so. Any other helpful. questions you have for me? Not right now. Okay, I feel good. like my my brain got massaged. Okay, good. I like uh, it. I like a good brain massage. That's I'm nice. Nice and uh, excellent. Loose. Great. Now, um, what neighborhood do you live in? Mid City. Great. So, Greg Saffel, you can tell him I sent you. 
Okay. And he is a fantastic vocal coach, and he's affordable. Was he at the meetup? He was. At the meetup. He was at the meetup. Mm-hmm. How many of you need voice yeah. training? Remember when you I was like, "All should have your hands up." Yeah, none of them had their hands up. <laughs> yeah. Not a singular person had their hands up. I couldn't even believe it. I was like, "You are bad, children. Bad. Everyone gets bad." Oh my okay, good. Gosh. So that was really funny. Okay, so we'll continue on. But before we do, I do want to ask you, I always ask uh, actors of diverse category mm-hmm. if they have anything they want to talk about or reflect about being a diverse actor in this industry at this moment. Representation is, mm. is it couldn't be more important. Yeah. Um, that's something that's always been so, so, so important to me. Mm-hmm. I guess... Well, go back to sports, but growing up and and wanting to be in uh, the MLB mm. or the mm-hmm. NFL, mm-hmm. I would always see people that look like me, yeah. and I'd be like, "Oh wow, I can I can do that." Mm. Then, um, in the entertainment industry, I feel like there are a lot of people of color, a lot of kids or aspiring actors, actresses who. Mm may not see themselves in certain roles. Yes. And so I think it is so important that everyone knows that you can be whatever role. Yes. And you should be able to see someone who looks like you or you should be able to see yourself uh-huh. in that role. And that is so, 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 so important to me. Great. Um one of my dreams, like, you know, under, uh, you know, the, the superhero right. and the lawyer cop and fireman and stuff is to be in a Western. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. watching all the really cool West. Oh, my grandma That's used so to huge. love watching Westerns. Mm. She used to watch her. She's like, get out of here. I'm watching my Westerns. And she's always watching Westerns. And sometimes I watch them with her. And... Th- so there were stereotypical roles mm-hmm. in these westerns, mm-hmm. or there was a lack of, mm-hmm. you know, diversity or color mm-hmm. in these westerns. And you know, now I guess it's getting better now um, in certain westerns, like the Hateful yes. Eight and whatnot. But nah, yeah. no, it's true. Honestly, first of all, thank you for that perspective because anytime we voice what we feel like is a deficit mm-hmm. in representation of anything, it's valuable for people to just go, oh, that's. That's true, actually. Right. And I will say that I remember watching America, the Story of Us, mm. which is this great documentary on the History Channel. It's like eight episodes long. It's forever. But it doesn't cover the moments you already know about history. It like, completely skips the Civil War and then goes to like the aftermath of the Civil War. And one of the things that I remember finding so shocking was how much of the cowboys were African-American and Hispanic because it was a lot of freed slaves from the emancipation who went out west to pursue land. And the jobs that they then got were to steer cattle, move cattle from Texas over to the rail line, Mm. which went straight from the east to the west. So they were herding cattle from the south and moving it north to the rail line. And I remember thinking, like, well, that's really shocking because I have seen every Western. Yeah. And I, when I think of a Western, I automatically think white guy. Like, I <laughs> automatically think. Right. We go and it was so mm-hmm. mind-blowing to think, like, Hispanic and African-American cowboys? Who knew? Uh, who knew? <laughs> I literally felt like I had no idea. Not only who knew, but that it was it was so prevalent right. it wasn't even just like a, an exception it was like no that was a group of people who suddenly were free and now needed jobs mm-hmm. and then there was an expansion of the west that was like come i will hire you so i think that's great i'd love for that story to be told yeah i would love i would like I wouldn't you yeah, love that a story right there right you guys <laughs> right right, right? isn't that a great story of like a, a group of freed slaves who find themselves after the war jobless and then moving to the expansion of the West and finding all of the things that happened in the expansion of the West. Right. And everything that entails. Everything that entails. Yeah. Survival of at its most, right? Boom. 
Make it, yeah. guys. Write it. <laughs> Write it okay, down. Okay, very good. So I have a few down. questions I ask to everyone. Social media, do you want to plug yourself yourself on social media? Sure. Um, on Instagram, I am at the Will Jr. T H E W I L L J R. And on the Twitter, Twitter, <laughs> I am at the Will Jr. 100. So same thing, and then just add one zero zero. Great. Why acting? It became very cathartic mm. for me. Mm-hmm. As a football player, I I, I tend to kind of hold on to emotions and Mm. let them out on the field Mm. so now i feel like letting them out on the stage or um through a character is one of the most relieving things in the world for me awesome i just want to like point on that you know how you say you love to go out on the field and like express yourself and put it on the field Mm -hmm. and i'm sure that's what you do in workouts right absolutely got expression and feeling so i want this is going to help you with your voice do that in your voice Ah, use right. see think about it <laughs> yeah. use your vocal warm ups as an opportunity to do that. to express as well and uh-huh. that's when your vocal warm ups become even more powerful right is when you're not just doing them cuz you know you could like lift weights or you could lift weights with intention mm-hmm. it's like you could do your vocal warm ups or you could do your vocal warm ups with intention right and really use that like if you're doing a vocal exercise Use that exercise to express this thing that you've got to express, even though you're not doing it on words, you're yeah. just doing it on sound. And that's mm-hmm. the thing I really want you to get good at is not just expressing yourself physically, but expressing yourself through sound. Right. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually just started reading a book called The Lucid Body. Yes. And good for you. Audible exhale. Yes. The <laughs> audible exhale is real. I got to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Ha, yeah. Ha, ha, ha. Ha. That's all you do in voice class for four years in a conservatory is you just go. Ha, mm, ha, ha, that's it. Ha, ha. Yeah. That's it. You're welcome. That's to it. Okay. <laughs> Take that. Yeah. What is the best part about the business for you? It's rewarding. Uh, I have people who have reached out to me mm. um, who were in the situation that my character, Aaron in Greenleaf, is in, mm-hmm. which is a tough situation. He is a gay black man mm. living in the South mm-hmm. whose father was the pastor of a mega church. And I've had people reach out to me in that same situation or similar situation mm-hmm. and told me they were moved and inspired and they were able to, you know, live in their truth. Mm. And that is, ugh, that's everything to me. That's winning. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And people are, you know, able to do that through my work. Well, it's what you're saying about representation. In that story being told, it having representation in a mass way Mm-hmm. then it gives people permission to feel that they are okay. Mm-hmm. Love that. So. Great. What's the worst part about the business for you? Um, I don't book every single ah! thing I go out. Well, you got to be in voice class. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Until you're in voice class. <laughs> Great. No, no, I guess, uh, I guess it's the waiting. I guess it's the waiting. Um, one thing I was taught uh, when I first started acting was that – you need to be the most patient person on earth. And I was like, ah, okay. And then learn patience. And then you, you just have to keep learning it again and again. And that's tough. I think it's particularly tough for athletes mm-hmm. because you see results really clearly and fast. Even right. if it takes longer, it's the line is still really clear. Uh, and it's like, I do these reps. I get this strength. Right. I do this cardio. I can lean out. It's like you get this equals this and the results are clear and that can be addictive because it feels very empowering. And an acting career doesn't have a lot of that. Right. You can right. you can do all the reps and then you still didn't lose weight. No results. It doesn't make <laughs> sense, right? Mm-hmm. Great. What do you wish somebody had taught you or managed to get you to understand when you were just a wee babe entering this business for the first time? The business. Mm. Um, that you should really seek out seminars and mm-hmm. classes mm-hmm. for managing your money. Mm-hmm. So yeah. between that and the patient thing, 
Uh, I think those are something that need to be taught sooner. Yeah, it's a it's a business thing. Have you taken the money management class at the Actors Fund for free? <laughs> at the Actors Fund? Yeah, the Actors Fund is a free fund funded by actors for actors, funded by show business people for show business people. You don't have to be an actor. And they have a money management class that is free that I think should be required for all actors everywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. And they that's... talk a lot about like the bang and bust and the men- the maintaining and if you're a particularly long stretch of bust, like what are the best jobs that you can have that still have flexibility and they have access to companies that are looking for actors to hire because of all the great things that actors come with. So I really recommend them. They're super great. I'm there. Okay, great. I'm there. Anything mildly interesting you have to share? Um, I've recently started watching Shameless. <gasps> yes. It's amazing. It's so good, isn't it? It's so, so good. Yeah. I go through all the emotions. Ah, yes, right? Yes. Yeah, you're mad at them. Then you feel bad for them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, I almost started crying one episode oh. um, because I, I guess one just hit close to home because I... Uh, I was raised by a single mom, mm-hmm. and I was like, Yo, "This is crazy." I was yeah. just laughing, and the next second, why am I like <laughs> tearing up? I like that Shameless is your version of "This Is Us." Yeah. Just like listens, watches it, and it's like, I'm so emotional." Yeah. That's hilarious. Uh, my yeah. mildly interesting is a new podcast I'd like you guys to start listening to called "Happier in Hollywood." It's two female writers mm-hmm. who are seasoned writers, directed by WME. They are showrunners, they're staff writers, and the episode's not too long, they're about a half hour, and they have such great, helpful information talking about the business from the perspective of being a showrunner and being a writer. And for those of you who intend to be creators and creatives in addition to just being actors, I think particularly if you are an aspiring female writer or showrunner, but definitely also men, the more you know about the other people who are involved in your art form, the better you're going to feel. And I promise you, you're going to chill out. It chills you out to know more because you realize how much you're just like one little cog in a giant machine and you can't think you're more important than you are or else you start freaking out. Yeah. So start freaking out. Okay, good. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. It was thank a pleasure. Thank you so much. You pleasure is all mine. Absolutely. And you guys, don't forget your towel. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Next week on Audrey Helps Actors, Amy's back. Amy Linden is back. We had such a good time talking season one. And I have to say that episode on season one is one of the episodes I get the most comments on, compliments on. It's it really affected and impacted everyone. So, of course, we would have her back. And we talk about all things acting and leveling up. And a lot of things that, you know, she notices and that I notice are mistakes that actors make, whether that's in execution, whether that's in attitude, whether that's in having the time and energy to pursue your career. So I think you're going to find it really great. Just as great as the first episode was. Maybe even better. When Amy and I get in a role, sky's the limit, you guys. All right. Special thanks to Will. Will, I just adore you. I'm super excited for your career and really happy that you met with me and you gave me your time and your energy and your heart. He's got a big heart, you guys. And I hope that you're in voice class. You better be. This show is produced by Jesse Lumen, my now husband. What's up? You guys, he's still so handsome. This episode is edited by Patricia Cuffey Jones and Thomas Hank Snodgrass. Also, shout out to Thomas for the mic assistance now and then. It's still good to have your sound guy across the street. Show music is brought to you by Ari De Niro. Theme song assistance is by Alok Mehta and 108 Hill. All right, guys, don't forget your towel. So far, only two people have guessed it right. FYI, don't forget your towel.